Um, welcome. Uh, this is the third session of the AGSX Virtual Symposium. Um, it's an effort put on by the Arthropod Genomics Symposium and I5K. And the session today is all about bees. So Benome 100 and Comparative Bee Genomics. Wait, my slides will, here we go. All right, um, so ARS has also put a lot of effort into this collaboration as well. This is the third of three. Let's continue. And it's a great pleasure to, to introduce the first speaker who is Dr. Margarita Lopez Uribe from Penn State University. And Margarita um, is one of those rare folks who is, has really productive uh, research and teams going on both with honeybees, the preeminent but not so diverse pollinator and the native bees in North America and, and South America. And she's done a ton of really neat work. Um, after coming from Cornell with her PhD and then North Carolina State as a postdoc. And I will hand it over to you, Margarita, to enlighten us on one of the coolest bee stories that you've worked up. Uh, if you have your talk and can share it. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Margarita Lopez, and I am here to talk about phylogenomics and the impacts of agriculture on uh, a native squash bee. Well, so before I get started, I wanted to begin by acknowledging um, the contributions of co-authors. I'm primarily going to be talking about um, these recently published paper, uh, and I really wanted to make sure that uh, I, I acknowledged everyone's contribution to these to this uh, big study. So the lead author was Nate Pope, who is currently um, postdoc at University of Oregon, and he was really the leader on all the population genomic analysis, um, very talented um, bioinformatician and population genomicist. Avehi Singh is currently a graduate student in my lab, and she contributed with um, the lab, wet lab part of, uh, of the study. She did all of the analysis in the lab. Uh, Anna Shilders um, is also a bioinformatician. I'm, no, I'm sure you, you know her. Uh, she is one of the co-organizers of the symposium, and Anna helped us with the initial uh, assembly of the reference genome that we developed. Jay Evans also helped help with the development development of these uh, reference genome. He, he was um, he helped us with um, securing funding for the initial project, and Karen Kapheim uh, also contributed with that and um, with the analysis of the transcriptomes that we use to annotate um, the genome of the squash bee. Okay. So, well, I guess um, I'm going to get started with the, the fun part. Um, so I wanted to, to start by kind of emphasizing the importance of this idea of the agriculturalization of landscapes and how these increase and this expansion of agriculture at a global scale is really a major force of environmental change. So right now, about 40% of the land uh, on the planet has been converted from their, you know, like natural, from a natural habitat to uh, land that is used uh, for agricultural purposes to some extent. And this agriculturalization of landscape has been associated uh, with losses in biodiversity. And of course, these are, are not the exception to, um, to this general pattern. Um, this is a paper published in 2019 um, and was published by uh, Heather Grab, who basically demonstrated that uh, this increase in the proportion of agriculture at the landscape level is associated with um, um, decreases in uh, distance between uh, ecological distance between uh, different species, species richness at the community level, and phylogenetic diversity. So basically, again, um, this study supports that increases in agriculture decrease uh, bee biodiversity. However, when we look more carefully um, to how different species are responding to agriculturalization of landscapes, what we see is, well, um, most of the species here um, and indicated in red uh, on the tip of the phylogeny, most of the species are responding in a tech negative uh, way, like indicating that they're likely um, decreasing in abundance or where they're found. Uh, we do have some species that actually respond positively. So this is um, this question of what are some of the traits that uh, bees have that are associated with um, 
agricultural landscapes or what are some of the adaptive uh, responses that some bees are able uh, or show um, in association with agriculturalization of landscapes are some of the questions that in my lab we're really interested in. And so this is where these squash bees uh, come into play. They are very interesting, um, a very interesting group of uh, bees to answer this question. They are uh, narrow oligolectic, which really means that they are highly specialized on one type of, of plant. They only collect pollen from plants in the genus Cucurbita. Uh, and the, the genus Cucurbita uh, is the genus of the pumpkin and squashes and gourds, which, as we know, are very important. Um, and they are they are grown in agriculture, and they are very important economically. Uh, so basically, we have these species that is highly specialized on a plant that humans have decided to domesticate, and this poses a really unique opportunity to ask these types of questions. So from the plant side of things, um, these plants are also very uh, unique, and, and this is why, you know, the system is ideal to uh, ask these questions, because these plants are monaceous, which means that the, each individual plant has male and female part, um, reproductive parts, but they are located in different flowers. And so this makes these plants pollinator dependent, so they need biotic agents like bees to move the pollen from the anthers to the stigmas to achieve pollination. And because of these, the flowers produce these uh, vast amounts of floral resources that make them really attractive to bees. So they produce a lot of nectar, and they produce a lot of pollen as well. And so squash bees have um, uh, all of these ecological specializations for cucurbita pollination. So, for example, the, the flowers of these plants only last about six hours. They open very early in the morning and they wilt uh, at around noon. So squash bees phenologically are synchronized with this um, cycle. They uh, start visiting the flowers really early. Uh, as I was saying, the pollen of these plants tends to be very large and spiky. And so when we looked at the structure that the bees have to carry the pollen, the scopal, and those are called scopal hair, hairs, they are uh, sparse and they seem to be very effective in the transport of this pollen. And these bees, of course, they use this pollen uh, as a source of food, and so that means that they are a, a capable of digesting this pollen. Um, this is actually not something that most bees can do. For example, bumblebees and honeybees uh, cannot really use this pollen effectively, so they primarily visit the flowers for ne as a nectar resource. But even though squash bees have all of these specialized characteristics for uh, the pollination of cucurbita, this system is really asymmetric. So the plants are pollinated by a lot of different um, species of bees. So here I'm just showing you stingless bees and bumblebees, but the squash bees primarily use or exclusively use cucurbita as a source of pollen uh, for themselves. Okay, so um, so it is it is um, hypothesized that then there is a very close proximity between the the evolutionary history of the bees, which is what I'm showing you here on the left side, and the evolutionary history of the plants. Um, and so one of the the things that is clear from the um, the biogeographic patterns of both is that the likely origin of both of these groups is located in Mexico. Uh, in Mexico, we see the highest diversity in terms of species of both the bees and the plants. But something that is important to note is that there are no wild cucurbita that are native to North America outside of kind of like the, the deserts of the southwest of the U.S. And that there is one species of cucurbita that is uh, endemic to Florida. Uh, but really for the rest of the kind of like the temperate region of North America, we don't have um, wild cucurbita plants. However, currently we have a few species that are very abundant in continental US and part of Canada. And one of those species is uh, this lineage here that I'm showing uh, that is look, you know, indicated here in red, uh, Eucera prinosa, which is the species that I'm going to focus for my talk today. 
So um, when I say that these bees, these bees are found in North America, they are not only found here, they're extremely abundant. So here is a video of um, a cucurbita plantation in Pennsylvania. And so all of these things that you see flying around are actually squash bees. So we have thousands of these individuals concentrated in cucurbita plantations in um, in, and I think this is this is probably true for a lot of uh, places in in uh, North America. So the bees have not only expanded to temperate regions of North America, but they are quite abundant in these um, areas. So um, so here I just wanted to show you a map of the what we see in terms of the distribution of the bees currently, which is shown in, uh, by these yellow dots on the map of Mexico, the US, and southern Canada. And here in this pink bubble, I'm showing you the approximate distribution of the wild cucurbita that is um, used by these uh, user prognosa bees. So as you can see, the wild plant is really limited or restricted to um, kind of like northern Mexico and the southwest of the U.S. Um, um, in, you know, part here of the Colorado Plateau, while the bee is pretty much widespread throughout Mexico, uh, the U.S. and southern Canada. So one of the um, initial hypotheses is that these, the, these mismatching the distribution uh, of the, the bee and the wild plant was pretty much because of the cultivation of cucurbita. And so basically in a lot of these parts of where the bees currently found, these bees are basically living off cultivated cucurbita plants. And so to actually test these hypotheses, um, I, I did a study a few years ago looking at genetic patterns of um, patterns of genetic diversity of these bees across its distribution, looking at microsatellite markers. So here I'm just going to show you kind of like the key figure uh, for this study, where you can see in each pie chart, um, it's one microsatellite, the colors are indicating the relative proportion of different alleles. So basically you can see allele diversity. And these are all the populations that are found in areas where these cucurbita fetidissima, wild cucurbita, plant is uh, found. So if we look at the same patterns of genetic diversity or allele diversity in the eastern part of the distribution of the bee, what we see is that uh, the allele diversity and gen genetic diversity uh, overall is reduced. And this is one of the predictions uh, from a spatial population range expansion, basically that are consecutive bottlenecks um, that uh, facilitate this reduction in genetic diversity. And similarly, we see um, uh, reductions in the Western populations, even though it seems it appears to have been um, uh, an independent uh, event of colonization that resulted in the fixation of different alleles. And so with this first study, we found evidence of these spatial range expansion, uh, but we didn't really have a lot of details about the timing of these events and uh, whether um, these, these shift from these wild environments to agricultural environments was associated with adaptive changes. And so this is where this new study came about. Um, we started by generating a reference genome for these bees. So we use bees from Pennsylvania, and we combine uh, long uh, read sequencing, PacBio, Illumina, and HiC uh, libraries to develop a chromosomal level assembly for uh, for these squash bees. And the approximate genome size is about four hundred megabases. And then for the population genetic analysis, we did a combination of the microsatellites of the previous studies. And then we uh, augmented that with uh, SNP data collected from a subset of individuals um, that resulted in about um, 110,000 uh, SNPs. And then we also did some genome, full genome resequencing for some individuals. And so the, the prim primarily the two questions that we wanted to um, answer, two hypotheses that we want, that we had were the following. So the first one was that the domestication of cucurbita and the cultivation of cucurbita had not only uh, facilitated this spatial range expansion that the microsatellite data showed, but that uh, also that facilitated an increase in population size. 
So basically what we expected to see was an increase in effective population size um, in, these, in these species. The other thing is really related to what happened with the transition from these wild environments to agricultural environments. And so we hypothesized that this transition had facilitated uh, that adaptive processes in squash bees. But well, before I go into um, uh, showing the results addressing those uh, initial hypotheses, I need to start by uh, showing you what we found in terms of the population structure, because we did find a pretty uh, strong uh, phylogeographic structure in these bees. So what you're looking at on this map are admixture plots based on the SNP data from the Double Digest RADSEQ uh, libraries. And what you can clearly see is that Eusra prinosa is really a species, is, is really comprises uh, five different lineages. We have a lineage here uh, in Mexico that um, you know uh, was formed um, over a hundred thousand years ago. Uh, and then we have this eastern lineage that is found um, to the east of this mountain range here, indicated here uh, in what I'm showing you here. Then we have a western lineage that really diversified into three different lineages uh, in the Colorado Plateau, in the Great Basin, and in the Pacific Coast. And we have here uh, in the southwest of the U.S. and northern Mexico, this uh, admixture area that where we have a lot of secondary uh, admixture events that, you know, like, and this is why the populations look admixed in the plots. So, well, one of the, the things that we're currently um, investigating or we're following up on is the how these lineages can really um, um, be referred as different species. We're likely dealing with a species complex, but can we actually identify morphologically these different uh, bees? So we do see a lot of variation in color. However, color is not really a, a good, a reliable taxonomic character. Um, but in the past, when we when we look at the old papers describing um, species, uh, several of these color types uh, associated with different geographic regions have actually received different names. So we are currently looking at the morphological variation uh, to actually see if we can characterize these species as, um, as a species complex. Okay, so with that, uh, I'm going to jump right into the two hypotheses. Um, so just as a reminder, the first one was associated with increases in uh, effective population sizes associated with domestication of eucerpida. So, well, uh, we did that, that through coalescence simulations to estimate effective population sizes over time. So here we're going to zoom into the past uh, 25,000 years. You're going to see... Um, coalescent um, plots for the different lineages, Mexico, Colorado, Eastern, North America, Arizona, and uh, the Pacific Coast. And here I am showing you the two time points where uh, Cucurbita was domesticated in North America. So we did have two independent events of the species Cucurbita pepo. One is the oldest event that happened about um, 10,000 years ago, was one of the first crops domesticated in the New World. And we have the second domestication event about 7,000 um, years ago here in the Ozarks area. So what we hypothesize is that this domestication likely had uh, increased habitat for these bees and then have facilitated increases in effective population sizes. Um, so what we find is uh, something is slightly different. So here you can see the... Um, the changes in effective population size for, for example, Mexico, we do see that this population has significantly larger effective population sizes than um, the lineage in the Pacific coast, and there is a lot of variation in this. Uh, and if we focus our attention to these plots uh, in the kind of like the most recent past, we do find evidence for this synchronized super exponential increase in effective population size. So we do find support for that. What we um, 
found kind of what was surprising about these results though is that the the increase in effective population size was actually something that happened very very recently and it was not directly associated with the domestication of the crops per se but it was really uh, it seems to be associated with the introduction of maize into agricultural systems uh, across North America so when these happened when maize was introduced basically the size of agriculture increased and what we think is that these um, basically uh, increase the, the acreage or the, uh, the area that was used for the cultivation of these plants. And it was really this time when we observe uh, increase, uh, increases in effective population sizes of the bees. Okay, the second part is, um, the second hypothesis was re is related to the transition of, uh, from wild habitats to agricultural environments and how that may have facilitated adaptive uh, processes. Um, so basically, I just wanted to show you these two photos. Uh, these environments are vastly different. The wild plants are living deserts and they are um, actually animal species. The, the distribution of the plants is very patchy and low density. In agricultural areas, we see um, the, the plants are perennial. They are, of course, planted in like larger acreage. Um, and the, the crops are generally rotated to as, as part of like um, pest management control. So there may be less, um, less constancy in the spatial distribution of the floral resources. So uh, for these, what we did is we, we use full genome resequencing to actually look at um, um, patterns of genetic diversity uh, across the genome. Uh, we also uh, uh, identified a selective sweeps and um, may develop a new method to date the, the, the origin of these sweeps. And then we did a gene ontology analysis to get uh, some information about the potential functional um, functions of these genes that are under selection. And so here I'm just going to focus on three uh, different populations. The population here in southern Mexico, which again is part of the ancestral distribution uh, of the bee, coincides with the ancestral distribution of the plant. Uh, here the population of the Colorado Plateau, which is mostly uh, living off ag uh, agricultural plants, but is in close proximity to the ancestral range of the bee in the plant, and uh, the population from Pennsylvania, which again is, is, a, a, is a, bee, a population of bees that has been exclusively living off agriculture um, for uh, thousands of years. Okay, so uh, just looking at the, the number of selective sweeps across the genome, what we find is that there is a pretty significant um, number of the genes, the coding genes in the genome are under selection. About 20% of them um, show or are, yeah, are under selection. And we do see a concentration of these selective sweeps in the Eastern North America lineage. So about 12% of those um, selective sweeps are concentrated in the Eastern North America lineage. We do see a small number in Western North America or Colorado, and we don't really see um, the selective sweeps in, in Mexico. And um, this is clear when we actually looked at the um, patterns of nucleotide diversity at the genome level. So here I'm showing you um, the uh, expected, the, here in the x-axis, I'm, I'm showing you the expected uh, nucleotide diversity uh, based on um, models of background selection and recombination. And here is the observed data the, of the nucleotide diversity um, observed in the genome. So if you look at what we see in Mexico, basically we see a very um, close association between the expected and the observed. Uh, the same is true for Colorado. We do see some uh, selective sweeps here that are not explained or not predicted by this background um, selection model. But when we look at the pattern at, in Eastern North America, we do see there is a large proportion of these selective sweeps that uh, are not explained by the model. 
And uh, when we when we look at the the timing of these selective sweeps, what we can see is that uh, most of these selective sweeps actually seem to have uh, originated after um, the um, the domestication of the cupida. So in the past five thousand years ago when the bee transition from wild to uh, agricultural environments uh, is when most of these selective sweeps seem to have originated. And um, also very interesting, uh, what we see is that in the, um, um, in the GO analysis, we do see genes uh, associated with sensory biology that are overrepresented in, in the gene ontology. So if we look at this table um, that are uh, genes associated with odor and binding, olfactory, uh, olfactory reception, chemical stimulus, perception of smell, and sensory perception. So um, this is, of course, something that we are focusing on at the moment. Uh, but for these, you know, like uh, in, for this study, we basically found uh, a pretty compelling evidence that these adaptive processes are ongoing in the populations associated with uh, areas that um, or areas where the bees are primarily using agriculture um, uh, as their as, as their habitats. So part of the ongoing work is being led by Avehi Singh who is um, actually studying wh whether the floral cues of domesticated plants uh, can be associated with, um, uh, have changed the olfactory systems and actually kind of like phenotypically the olfactory systems and the olfactory responses of the bees. And this work is um, based on work from a, a former postdoc, Christine Brochu, who actually did a pretty detailed characterization of the wild and the domesticated plants and found that the process of domestication of these plants actually has facilitated uh, or is associated with shifts in the volatile profiles of, um, of the plants. So, well, as a take home message, I, um, I I wanted to leave you with these two things that this study of these native squash bee um, is, is providing an example of the expansion of agriculture shaping um, the recent evolutionary history of these pollinators. And we think that these happen um, because one of the reasons is because this expansion of agriculture is providing more abundant and reliable floral resources for these bees at a continental scale. The second take home message is that this transition to these novel agricultural environments have also facilitated adaptive processes for uh, bees that exclusively inhabit in agricultural areas. And so we're currently really working on characterizing how these um, changes in the genomes are associated with um, changes in the phenomes of the bees. Well, and with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Uh, I would like to thank the uh, NSF and USDA, and yeah, that are currently two postdoc positions in the lab. If anyone is interested in coming and working with the squash bees, please shoot me an email. This is my, my lab group at the moment, and that is my contact information. If you have any questions, please uh, reach out. Thank you so much. Okay. So much, Margarita, adapting to playing your movie as well. Um, there is a question for you in the Q and A. Can you see that? Or... Yes. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm. Um, I was typing, but I guess I can. No. Probably just in record. real life, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> so there was a paper. Um, maybe a couple of years ago, they did a nutritional analysis of about a hundred different types of plants and cucurbita was, one species of cucurbita was uh, included. I don't remember the details of, you know, the, the ratios of proteins and lipids and all of that, but there wasn't something that was particularly um, different about the nutritional value of, um, of the pollen of cucurbita. So it is unclear why some bees can uh, use that pollen and some bees cannot. It seems to be something uh, more related to the kind of like the, the physical uh, protection, the spikiness of the pollen 
but this is definitely an area that um, is still kind of an open question. Um, the second question is, do the genes under selection in bees have functions that correlate to nutritional differences in the pollen? Um, I am not sure if we know uh, this. So from, from this first study, what we see is that there, there seems to be a clear um, signature of adaptation in the sensory systems, but I, I am not sure if that changes in, in how they sense or they communicate with the, the flowers is related to changes in the nutrition of the, the, the pollen or the, the floral resources. So that's a, that's a really good question. Thank you, Brenda. Um, Jay, you, you tell me if I should just like, you know, let others, you know, let the other videos start or if let's something... catch the next question from Marina and then we should move on to Arian's. Okay. Um, uh, <clears throat> Marina is, have you checked for specific genes related to pesticide? Okay. And so Marina, we, we did, and we report that in the paper, there was one, uh, gene associated with, um, uh, detox, a detoxification pathway that was um, also in the kind of group of genes that were represented in the selective sweeps. Um, but yeah, there was one of, you know, like the 200 and or almost 300 genes that we uh, identified. So uh, this is also definitely an area of, um, you know, I hope future research for this system. And I will reply to Terence in the, in the chat. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Margaret. Yes, please keep the questions coming. They will be answered in due time. Uh, we do have uh, time at the end of the, the three uh, talk sessions for discussion. And, and um, so, so yeah, keep sending your questions in. Uh, let's move on though to our next speaker who is uh, Ariane Avalos from the USDA in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Um, Ariane is, is a Florida man originally who went to Indiana University for his master's and then um, the University of Puerto Rico with a uh, uh, good honeybee lab there led by Tugru Jare and learned to do quantitative genetics with honeybees and, and has done some really neat stuff with uh, now quantitative genomics. Uh, Ariane, will you be able to play your video? Uh -oh. And uh, yeah, 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 sorry. Give me okay, one fantastic. second so I can set Thank things you. up. And I, I take on bridge to the floor of the mem comment. Thank you very much. Okay, it's all yours. Yeah, I will say in the the microphone on this talk is a bit low, so you might have to turn up your sound, everyone. Just to bear in mind so you don't miss anything. Good day. I first would like to start by thanking the coordinators for their invitation and the opportunity to talk to you about a new set of genomic tools being developed for honeybees. Specifically, I'm here to introduce the concept of the honeybee pan genome, its use, and how it can be incorporated into the study of honeybee genetics from population to gene-specific analysis. Presently, the standard approach for honeybee genetic research is to sequence individuals or pools of honeybees represented here in different colors and aligning the information to the current community reference in the graph, the gray line. This approach has been exceedingly valuable and has led to a revolution understanding of honeybee genetics. At its core, though, it is predicated on the degree of similarity between these individuals and the single bee used as a reference. In the case of the current honeybee reference, the individual in question is a DH4 line drone, brother to all other individuals used to construct the past two community references. Generally, comparison to a single reference is not a concern, and indeed we can readily identify an overwhelming range of variation with just this method. If you all pardon me waxing Rumsfeldian for a couple of slides, using the single linear reference method, for example, we have been able to identify the known knowns of genetic variation, that is, conserve and novel genetic variation that differentiate honeybee populations. But we are also able to identify the known unknowns, variation that may be unique to a population or that might be considered complex when comparing it to a reference assembly. In fact, we can even intuit that there are unknown unknowns, that is, spans of genetic information we are missing likely due to deletions unique to the reference B. Ultimately, though, the reference is a simple model, 
and alignment to it by its nature reduces the complexity likely to be found in honeybee populations. Here, I would like to introduce you to the graph pen genome concept. At its core, this approach utilizes genetic information from a panel of individuals to develop a better model. This model, in turn, can provide a greater understanding of genetic variation in honeybee populations and can help discover new genomic information long overlooked or unnoticed across the genome. The generalized methodology for building a pan genome first tries to establish founder assemblies. Ideally, these are high quality near reference assemblies with a high degree of completeness. This data set, along with the current community reference, is then used to construct the debridging graph assembly. This catalogs the path of each individual as a sequence and identifies dissimilarities between individuals as branch points. Once established, the graph assembly can then be used as a reference and in combination with short read sequencing of additional individuals can already be deployed in traditional studies. Another benefit of this approach is that the model creates a living process and additional information can always be incorporated to improve the catalog of variation in the graph. Presently, we're applying this approach to develop the first honeybee pan genome, which incorporates variation from key research populations. Our efforts are focusing on three research lines established directly or through collaborations with the Honeybee Breeding Genetics and Physiology Lab in Baton Rouge. It also includes two key breeding lines developed as part of independent programs and a general Italian honeybee stock to represent the commercial populations. For each of these populations, we collected one representative male drone sample, as well as a supporting sample set of drones taken from breeding source queens. Together, this data set forms a comprehensive representation of the mating pool for each of the target honeybee populations in the study. We are interested in these populations due to their efficacy in combating varroa infestation. The varroa mite is a principal pest leading to one of the four factors directly impacting honeybee colony survival in the United States. Using novel samples from a subset of these populations, we can develop a graph that has a direct benefit to beekeepers. In addition, by resampling some of the populations, we can compare variants identified using this method to previously identified genetic variation. Already, the use of a graph reference over a traditional linear reference has shown vast improvements. On a technical level, there are visible differences in completeness of alignments of supporting short read data between the two models. This is important as it improves confidence in the variants called from those reads. From a population genetics perspective, the results of the current analysis are concordant with past findings. Here we see a dimensional reduction plot where points correspond to sample drawn from the target population and for which proximity identifies genetic similarities across about 2.5 million markers. The pattern display in this plot is very similar to the findings in Sir Lau et al. 2020 which showed Pauline and Hilo as being somewhat separate from the rest of the honeybee populations we examined here and the, re and the remaining populations forming a cohesive spectrum of their own. Using this data set, we can also examine the structure of linkage to equilibrium across the genome in each of these populations. For samples, we see clear population-specific patterns of genome-wide linkage with more gradual declines of certain populations such as Pauline. This is somewhat expected for Pauline as the population is maintained through instrumental insemination. However, we can also see very unexpected patterns, such as the similarity in linkage between the commercial honeybee population we use as reference here and the Hilo research line. The similarity here is also surprising because the latter population is maintained through instrumental insemination, just like Pauline is. What this tells us is that possibly our commercial reference has experienced a bottleneck of its own. Generally, this is salient to the pangenome method uh, in that we can leverage this information of linkage spans with the information and the graph to further define potential complex structural variations. The use of a graph reference is also generalized enough that we can conduct the same test as we would with a linear reference approach. Not only that, but the resulting variance could be imminently compatible with existing data sets within reason. Here we highlight this functionality by looking at the intersect between our variants, which were called against the graph assembly, and those from an older data set, which were called against a linear reference. This older data set was examining ancestral genetic groups in European and African honeybee subspecies. And the purpose of our analysis is to take a look at how the potential ancestral groups are distributed within our populations, looking at the rates and differences in admixture between our samples. 
We clearly see differences in the contribution across our target populations, with some having greater contributions from some Western European subspecies, M in the graph, than the more Eastern subspecies, C in the graph. These preliminary results are being examined in greater detail, and presently we've updated to a more comprehensive data set from a recent manuscript on honeybee subspecies. We hope to leverage the greater resolution of that data set to assess the proportional contribution not only within the individual, but also across the genome. Arguably, the most relevant contribution a graph assembly can provide is in the analysis of complex structural variation. This is a set of analysis we're just now scratching the surface of, but one that can get us closer to knowing a bit more of those unknown unknowns. For example, here we're showing a bit of the dynamism that one can expect, and this is actually minor comparatively speaking to the rest of the genome. In this figure, you have each line corresponding to one of the founder assemblies that we contributed to develop the graph. And as you can see, there's quite a bit of uh, synthetic spans, but also a bit of variation across all these assemblies, specifically uh, breakoffs that highlight complex structural variation between these uh, assemblies. To provide a bit of a more tangible example to the type of structural variants uh, we continue to uncover while we do our analysis, I'll talk a little bit here about a specific instance which we recently uncovered. Like in the previous figure, each span in this uh, slide corresponds to a founder assembly. Uh, highlighted is the current community linear reference. Now, these assemblies are each uh, chunked, and each one of those chunks uh, corresponds to actually a contig in the assembly. The lines between these contexts then uh, denote the type of relationship, and so you are looking for a specific line that remains largely contiguous and not crossing each other as you look at the figure. One aspect you can likely already note is the highlighted region. Here we see a complex set of associations between the assemblies, but poignantly it seems to show how all other populations have some form of reconfiguration when compared to the current linear reference. This is a bit counterintuitive. What this is actually showing is that in this region, the current linear reference is likely a unique inversion. This is why when all other assemblies are compared to the reference, they look more similar to each other than they do to that. Consider then how much information may have been misconstrued in both genetic analysis as well as gene expression studies in this region due to a previously undetected uncommon inversion in the reference. These precise events is why we aim to develop the use of fan genome uh, for honeybee genetic research. And at least in this study, aim to catalog these potential pitfalls. So far, I've talked about a targeted pan genome that's largely potentially of use for US population analysis. However, beyond the current pan genome project outlined here, we're also in the midst of establishing an international collaborative working group to apply the same strategy to worldwide honeybee populations. The pan genome is ultimately modular, and the graph can serve as an ever-expanding reference tool, including more genomic information as quality assemblies become more available, and leading to ever-increasing gains in the accuracy of our scientific analyses. This broader international project aims to obtain an assembly and representative population samples from each of the 25 to 30 honeybee subspecies across the world. Presently, we aim to meet and then expand on past collection efforts with specific focus aim at those populations previously undersampled. In this way, we can begin to build a comprehensive catalog of genetic variation across the whole of honeybee global populations. Once we achieve a worldwide honeybee pan genome, our next goal poses to also to be able to incorporate the, the 10 or so sister taxa without a reference assembly or population data within the genus APIS in our sampling effort. The hope is that once the genomes become available at this scale, we can then begin to examine conserved regions across all these species, building synthetic networks between the reference assemblies, where we can track genomic evolution and cross-species shifts in genetic variation. I recapitulate the graph image here because we already have attempted to examine some of this in our analyses. In this figure, the blue line corresponds to Apis serrana, the Asian honeybee, and a sister taxa to Apis mellifera, our common European honeybee. Work is ongoing at this level, but this approach could provide powerful insight on ancestral states and many honeybee traits towards the ultimate benefit of breeding for healthier and more resilient bees. I would like to again thank the coordinators for the opportunity to present USDA ARS for their support in this research. I would also like to specifically acknowledge the work put in by Dr. Garrett Slater, a headquarters postdoc in my lab that's been taking the lead on much of the population genetic work you've seen here 
as well as the rest of the Honeybee Pen Genome Working Group, of which specifically Dr. Justin Vaughn and Andrew Antano, who have been seminal on the individual and graph assembly side of the construction. Lastly, I would like to thank my lab members for their in-house support and to you all for your attention. All right, that should have done it. Is that, did that go through okay? That worked, yeah. Thank you, Ariane. Um, any questions in the Q&A? And I, for whatever reason, I can't type into that. But I was curious about this big, big possible inversion in the reference uh, sequence. It looked like going vertically down that line, there were other cases of... Um, Sorry, that. Jay. Um, my audio is still kind of on the fritz, thanks yeah. to the presentation. Can you repeat? Okay. Sure, yeah. Uh, no, I just had a quick question um, sneaking in before Brett Sunny come in on the Q and A. That 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 largish inversion in the middle of your 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 assembly of all the pan genomes that that you that you um, say is unique to the to the current reference. As you look vertically down that list, it seems like there are other kind of major shifts in that one region. Is that and and I guess not knowing the scale and such is that a is that part of I, I, and I missed it is that part of one chromosome is that is that sort of concatenated chromosomes across left to right in that graph or um, I guess is there more evidence for major shifts in the honeybee genome structure? Uh, yeah, I mean that region in particular. Um, so like that was just kind of an example of some of the outcomes that we get from from these sort of sort of um, yeah. like genome genome alignments essentially. Mm -hmm. and so, yeah, that part has a lot of other variation. But if you look generally speaking, like the pattern tends to be the pattern tends to be uh, one where uh, it, you know most of the populations tend to be more similar in terms of like the reconfiguration that has occurred and so, okay. so like, then that would be like oh possibly the reference is actually unique which then puts into question quite a bit of things essentially it might it might not after i we do the full analysis and make sure mm -hmm. things said it because there's follow-ups that we're planning on applying uh it might turn out that like that's that might not be the case but then it would be likely uh, regions of uh, or, or types of variations that are occurring within that region that you know the graph would still account for, whereas uh, and, you know depending on where you're doing your population analysis, right, um, you might not want to do the linear reference because the reconfiguration wouldn't be right anyways, essentially. So sure. yeah, no, so yeah, it's very neat. It definitely shows the power of doing these independent uh, assemblies for the pan genome. It's neat. Uh, Anybody else either uh, in the Q&A have questions at the moment, or you can, of course, continue to post them over the next hour and a half or find Ariane later. Um, not seeing any, I think we will move on to the next topic, which is uh, back to the diversity of bees. And our first speaker there is uh, Catherine Paris, who's at the USDA in um, Stoneville, Mississippi, where she's protecting pollinators in a, in a somewhat inhospitable uh, environment at times. So she's doing a great job with the native pollinators and their interactions with us humans in um, South, but she's also a leader in the prioritization and collection of bees all over the country for the Benome 100 project. So take it away. Oh, and, and Catherine uh, was a Northeasterner, but has somehow migrated to the South starting in uh, grad school. And Hi, everybody. Are you ready for me, Jay? Go for it. Yep. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting us to speak today. I'd like to go ahead and introduce ourselves and our project. Uh, my name is Catherine Paris. I'm a research entomologist with the USDA ARS, and I'm currently located in Stoneville, Mississippi. My co-presenter today is Michael Brandstetter, who is located with the ARS as well in Logan, Utah. And we'll be talking about a peek into the bees of the Beano 100 project. So a quick little outline before we get too far. First, we'll cover bee biodiversity, biology, and the importance of bees. Uh, an overview of the Beanome 100 project. We'll talk about, talk about taxa selection, collecting, and field trips. We'll talk a little bit about field sampling and vouchering, uh, Beanome 100 sequencing and data processing, current progress and results, and what's up next for the Beanome project. 
I'll be covering this first half and then we'll be switching speakers and Micah will take over from there. So bees exhibit a bimodal species richness pattern where dry seasonal climates are the most diverse. So as you can see on this map, the areas that are in red are gonna be more diverse or are predicted to be more diverse than areas that are in blue. Overall, globally, there's almost 21,000 described species of bees across seven families. And here in the US, we have almost 3,600 species of bees. Uh, comprised of 112 genera, 39 tribes, 15 subfamilies, and six families. Areas of the highest diversity and species richness in the U.S. occur in the western deserts and in the southwest. Some of these groups and species only occur in the U.S. just a little bit um, on the southern borders uh, of Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas, along with the Mexico. So overall, the Benome 100 project aims to sequence, assemble, and annotate the genomes of 100 U.S. bee pollinators while also strengthening resources for the honeybee, a key pollinator and insect model. The Benome 100 project is a coordination across 14 USDA ARS research units and many, many university collaborators, including the University of Illinois, UC Irvine, Riverside, the USGS, Penn State University, York University, Brock University, the University of Utah, Princeton, Cornell, and the University of Alabama, just to name a few. Uh, Michael and I are the co-leads for the Species Identification and Prioritization Group. Um, other groups or focuses include project leads who are managing all of this. Uh, we have computational leads, groups that are interested in genome structure, microbiome, bee habitat, social evolution, and chemical stress, along with additional groups that have set up. Um, if you're interested in being a part of this or following along, we do have a website, benome100.org, or you can email us directly as benome100 at usda.gov. So when we look at our collection and sequencing teams, Michael and I are located, as I mentioned earlier, Michael's in Logan, Utah, and I am in Stoneville, Mississippi. Along with the two of us, uh, Terry Griswold and John Koch are also located in Logan, Utah, and Joe Wilson is at the University of Utah. Jeff Lozier rounds out our group at the University of Alabama. Our sequencing group is Scott Geib and Sh Shanna Sim, who are both in Hilo, Hawaii, and then Brian Scheffler, who is also here in Stoneville, Mississippi. Uh, when we selected the original groups of taxa for this project, one of the big first steps was identifying existing and planned projects by other researchers to make sure that this was complementing other work and wasn't uh, competing with it or stepping on other people's planned projects. So part of the things that we took into account when we started looking at uh, planning and taxa to collect for this was to make sure that we had a broad taxonomic diversity across the bees. Our original goal was to make sure that we had a representative of every tribe, but that's been revised in the last year that our goal is to get one, me one member of each genera or each genus in the U.S. sequenced. Uh, we've taken into consideration whether or not a species of, is, is of agricultural importance or what its conservation status may be across the broader space. Um, we're interested in geographic diversity uh, and life history diversity, so we've taken into account whether or not insects are social, uh, what their nesting habitats might be, what their broader uh, habitat they live in looks like, and how much project interest there is across people that are involved. We definitely have plans to produce papers and answer interesting questions about bees as a whole. But one of the major challenges that Michael will address later is collecting high quality samples for sequencing. So at this point, we've had collection locations across a wide swath of the country. Um, many of these are collected through Michael's lab or my lab or trips that we've uh, done together. But I'll start by talking about these points in the desert southwest. So the Southwest, as I mentioned earlier, is a unique opportunity to make sure that sequencing efforts cover a wide variety of taxonomic groups and represent unique fauna. Recent papers suggest that the San Bernardino Valley, south of the New Mexico boot heel and the Arizona mountains, have some of the highest density of bees of any long-term studies in North America once it was standardized for area. 
and several of the neotropical groups that have been occasionally caught only range slightly over the border or could be blown over. The other perk to collecting in this part of the country is that there's a uh, large quantity of historical collection records. So the American Museum of Natural History has a Southwestern Research Station who, which teaches the B course, and it's been taught from 1999 to current, um, though they did not teach in 2020 or 2021. And so there's actually a wealth of knowledge with 20 years of known collecting locations for some fairly rare taxa. Uh, so we've made four trips out to the Southwest in support of this trip. Um, there's a variety of pictures, roadside collecting, pretty flowers. Uh, so we've been, we started in fall of 2021. We went twice in 2022, and we've only just returned this year from a spring trip. Uh, the research station is located in the Chiricahua Mountains uh, at about 5,000 feet, so it's possible to go all the way up into the range to collect at higher elevations as well as to go down into the desert. So when we look at southwestern contributions to the project, in fact, some of these, quote, rare taxa can be actually locally abundant in the, in the right place. Uh, taxa found or collected in the Southwest that are already in the sequencing queue include Martinapis, Zachosmia, Dioxys, Macrotera, Ashmediella, Adiposmia, Tilaglossa, Copalacana, Prodendrona, and Lithogopsis. We're still looking for some Southwestern tax targets, including Mexilistis, Mesoxea, and several others. As part of these trips, we've also collected feral honeybees for the Pangenome Project and some of Arian's work. We've also stopped and collected in the Douglas Mountains uh, in deep west Texas on both mesquite and some local wildflowers. My lab's also made uh, trips over into central Texas. We've collected in both the Dallas, Houston, and College Station areas on a wide variety of plants. My lab is based here in Mississippi, so we have done a lot of local collecting here. We've also traveled over into Louisiana to look at some flooded wetland areas, uh, along with some agricultural crops, and roadside into Arkansas to look at prairie remnant habitats. And then just recently, Michael's lab got back from a epic collecting trip uh, that we missed, sadly, but they traveled through California, Nevada, and Utah, partially in support of the Perdita Maconis work, which Michael's going to talk about here in a little bit, but they collected on a wide variety of blooms across the Southwest. And with that, I'll hand it over to Michael. Thank you guys very much. Thanks, Catherine. I'm going to go ahead and get my talk uh, up and shared. Hi everyone, thanks to Catherine for a great introduction to bees and BNM100. I am Michael Brandstetter and I work in the Pollinating Insects Research Unit in Logan, Utah. I will be giving part two of this BNM100 overview talk. Like Catherine, one of my main contributions to BNM has been to prioritize species for sequencing and to collect new species in the field. The first part of my talk focuses on the challenges of collecting bees for genome sequencing and goes over the processes we have developed to ensure high quality results. Beyond fieldwork and collecting, my research unit, in collaboration with others, has become involved in processing and analyzing the incoming genome data. For the rest of my talk, I will discuss the data workflow and present some early results, as best I can. I will end our overview talk with a look towards the future. To generate a high-quality reference genome using the latest long-read sequencing methods, it is essential that we acquire fresh, high-molecular-weight DNA. Unfortunately, this means that we cannot rely upon traditional museum collections to acquire species for sequencing, and we must instead venture out into the field to collect new specimens that get flash frozen as quickly as possible and that are left that way until sequencing. Bees present unique challenges for a major genomics project like Benome 100. Bees vary greatly in size with some, spe some species being minute and others being quite large, although never as large as mammals or birds. Bees have a haplodiploid sex determination system, which means that males are haploid and females are diploid. This is generally beneficial in that by sequencing males, the assembly process is simplified. However, it also means that specimen sex information, in addition to species ID, needs to be carefully checked and recorded before sequencing. Lastly, bees are very diverse and, and identifying species in the field can be difficult, 
particularly when specimens need to go from net to freezer immediately. For Benome, we've acquired specimens from lab colonies, commercial vendors, and most often from new field collections. Catherine and I have collected many species ourselves, and we've also reached out to other Benome 100 participants and outside collaborators to get material. Getting identifications on all specimens and keeping vouchers is critical to ensure that new genome information can be linked to a species name, ensuring robust science. For those who are new to Benome, we often get asked these common sampling questions. How many specimens are needed? What sex is best? How do we collect bees and get species identifications in the field? For Benome, we aim to get a minimum of two specimens, one as a voucher and one for sequencing. However, collecting more specimens is always better, particularly for, for smaller species where the inputs from a single specimen are insufficient to carry out all types of sequencing. Male specimens are preferred because they are haploid and thus simplify the assembly process, but diploid females are okay, particularly since genomes can be more easily phased using the long read sequence data um, that is now available. For identifying species, we generally use multiple methods, traditional identification of a voucher specimen, digital images, uh, and DNA sequence data like the barcoding gene CO1. Um, we also use a variety of these approaches to, to increase the, um, the confidence in, that, in those identifications. Um, on the right side of this slide, I show the general process that Catherine and I have come up with to collect, preserve, and image bees before genome sequencing. We generally collect bees with a net in the field. We transfer the live bees to capture tubes and chill them down on ice. We then take digital images of the bees while chilled and we freeze kill the bees in liquid nitrogen. We store the bees at negative 80 C back in the lab, um, and then we ship the bees on dry ice um, to the lab where the, where the specimens are ultimately extracted um, and, and the DNA is sequenced. Here are a couple of actual pictures showing the netting of bees in the field, the capture of live bees in snap cap files, and the processing of chilled bees in the back of a pickup truck. Our lab often goes out to remote places in the desert and sets up genome processing areas at our campsite. What makes this possible is that we use liquid nitrogen dry shippers that can stay cold for over two weeks when fully charged. We also bring microscopes equipped with headlamps so that we can check specimen sex and at least get a genus level ID on specimens. In addition to pinned voucher specimens, we try to collect relatively good images of every specimen that goes into the liquid nitrogen doer. The process has evolved over time, but on my, on my most, most recent trip, I used a DSLR macro camera setup and tried to take a series of images of every specimen before freezing in liquid nitrogen. I also take images of the bee uh, with the sample vial. Um, this is shown in the upper left. Um, this, help links, this helps link specimens to sample codes in the sequencing lab. In the future, it might be best to use barcoded tubes to avoid writing errors on tubes, but so far this system has worked fine. This imaged bee is Megandrina menzilii, a genus and species of Andrenidae collected for Benome just this last week. This species will represent the first Megandrina genome ever sequenced. Um, and on this slide, there are six additional species imaged in the same way. On my last trip to the desert, we collected about 150 new specimens for Benome, and I took on average about five images per specimen. While image vouchers are good to have, actual specimen vouchers that go into a research collection are also valuable. Since most bees are not social, these vouchers tend to be same series vouchers, which means that voucher specimens were collected at the same time and place as the sequence specimen, but they are not the specimen specimens used for sequencing. This differs from genome projects for larger vertebrate species, where there's a lot more tissue available in single specimens for sequencing. There's always a chance that the voucher is not the same species as the sequence specimen, but images and DNA can be used to check that the voucher is very likely the same species. The voucher specimens get labeled, databased, identified, imaged, and finally curated for long-term preservation. Our research collection, which is the U.S. National Pollinating Insects Collection in Logan, Utah, is a major repository for genome vouchers, and we're in the process of making all data and images available online. We also encourage, but do not require, Benome participants to deposit vouchers in our collection. Once specimens are collected and frozen, the Benome team selects species for submission and sends them to Hilo, Hawaii for processing, 
um, in USDA ARS's PBARC lab, where Scott Geib is the research leader. Some of the sequencing is also carried out in Stoneville, Mississippi by Brian Scheffler and his genomic lab, but most of the non-APIS bees are going to Hilo. This slide presents the general sequencing and data processing pipeline that we are using for Benome. Many people have contributed to this workflow, but I would like to especially acknowledge the contributions made by Scott Geib and Shana Sim, um, who are both in the Hilo lab, and also Anna Childers, who is in a USDA lab in Maryland. The Benome project has benefited greatly from another sequencing effort called AgPest 100, which is ongoing but began several years before Benome. Scott's lab initially specialized in extraction, DNA QC, and library preparation only, but after acquiring PacBio and Illumina-like sequencing instruments, his lab is also carrying out the sequencing for the project, which has increased efficiency. To generate gold standard reference quality genomes, we aim to sequence all species using three different approaches. PacBio HiFi sequencing is being done for the main genome assembly. Um, the recent development of low and ultra low in uh, ultra low library prep kits has enabled us to use small amounts of tissue um, for these library preps. In most cases, only single specimens are needed for adequate hi-fi sequencing. For scaffolding and genome curation, we are genera generating Illumina high c sequence data. Um, and finally, for annotation, we are doing RNA-seq, preferably using multiple libraries um, generated from different tissues of the same specimen. However, what can be done depends on the B and the number of specimens that get collected. Due to limits on tissue availability, some species only get sequenced for HiFi or HiFi plus HiC, but even HiFi only assemblies are much better than genomes of the past. The data processing workflow is iterative and loops around depending on results and availability of HiFi, HiC, and RNA data, as well as the sex of the B specimen submitted. As a quick overview, we assemble the HiFi data using HiFi ASM. We scaffold the assembly using the HiC data and the program HiC Yaz. We extract mitogenomes using MitoHiFi, and we annotate genomes using NCBI's standard annotation pipeline combined with new or existing evidence, such as RNA-seq data. We prefer to make genomes public and use NCBI's pipeline so that the annotations are consistent across genomes, which will be useful for, for, for um, comparative analyses in the future. We're also using a variety of tools to QC the raw data assemblies and curated genomes to catch and fix problems along the way. One of the most important tools is blob tools, which allows us to tag and re remove microbial contaminants from the genome assemblies. These data are of interest to the microbial group in Benome, who will be analyzing the microbes across bee species. As already noted, bees provide unique challenges to processing, uh, to data processing. Species vary in size and the number of specimens collected per, per species also varies. Uh, sometimes we, we, we have collected many large haploid male specimens, and sometimes we get very few small uh, diploid female specimens. In some cases, we even get single specimens of rare genera or species. Bees also tend to be dirty, and and dirty with pollen, and they can have hitchhiking parasites on them like mites or beetle larvae. This can go unnoticed in the field and could lead to more than one genome being sequenced inadvertently. Because of this variability, we try to clearly track specimen sex and the number of specimens submitted for each species. We also try to note which specimen or tissue was used for sequencing. It is also possible that multiple specimens for the same species might be mis-ID'd. And for that reason, we have discussed trying to get all sequence data from the same individual if the specimen is large. For assembling diploid genomes, it could be advantageous to have the HiFi and HiC data be from the same specimen because this helps phase the genome and reduce assembly errors caused by heterozygosity. However, lacking high c data doesn't preclude us from using diploids in the project. It just means that we have to be more careful when assembling and analyzing the genome data to avoid errors. Okay, so now for a progress update and some results. Ligia Benavides was hired last year as a research associate and project manager for Benome 100, and she has been helping to organize and track Benome progress over time. So far, we have submitted 101 species for sequencing. Taxonomically, we have covered all USB families, all US tribes, and 63 out of 112 USB genera. This includes existing genome projects from other um, researchers, um, which we have been careful to track to avoid duplicating efforts. On the data processing front, we have some data for 82 out of the 101 submitted species. And of these, only 24 have HiFi and HiC data generated so far. Um, RNA sequencing data is just starting to be, be, um, to be generated. 
Out of all of these species, um, only four species have so far been submitted to NCBI, and only a couple have been submitted for publication. But we are still in the early stages of, of the project. Uh, Lichia, along with Binome postdoc Raina Schweitzer, have also been compiling QC results for every species and putting these into a spreadsheet. This process has uh, helps us identify problematic samples so that we can alert Scott's lab about issues and try to fix them. We also contribute or coordinate with Scott's lab weekly to get updates on sequencing progress and to prioritize work. Both Lichia and Reina have been working with Scott and Shana to assemble, to assemble and analyze the incoming genome data. Uh, for the last part of my talk, I will present several vignettes highlighting a few genome target species and the sequencing results. The first species is Perdita maconis. This species was targeted for genome because it adds taxonomic diversity, it is a specialist pollinator of poppy plants, and it is a species of conservation concern, like a toast plant. Working with this species has been challenging because it is very small, it has a short activity season, it disappears during drought years, and the original specimens that we acquired for sequencing were frozen, frozen at negative 20 C rather than in liquid nitrogen. Rainer Schweitzer is leading this genome assembly project, and our goal is to provide a high quality assembly for population genomics and comparative genomics that will be useful in the conservation of this species. Despite the challenges, we were able to recover a high, very high quality reference genome using HiFi data only, generated from a single male Perdida maconis sample. On the left is a snail plot from the program Blob Tools, providing useful information about genome size and assembly quality. The Maconis genome um, is estimated to be about 330 megabases in size, and the Contig N50 is 17.5 megabases, which is very good. We also recovered a BUSCO score of 95.5% um, complete for single copy genes, and based on the bandage plot of the Contigs, we estimate the number of chromosomes to be between 12 and 18. Using blob tools, we have, we have identified and removed contaminant Contigs, and we're currently working to get the genome uploaded to NCBI for annotation. Our aim is to publish a small genome note on this species in the next six months, and my graduate student Colleen Might will be using this genome as a reference for population genomic analyses. We also intend to get more specimens and add HiC and RNA-seq data to improve the genome. Another goal of Benome is to sequence species of agricultural importance. Osmia lignaria is a solitary bee that is being studied and used as an alternative managed pollinator to the honeybee. The species is native to the U.S. and the Lignaria lignaria subspecies is potentially in decline in the eastern U.S. So far, we have generated a genome assembly from HiFi data only, um, with the data sequenced from a single male specimen. Again, the genome is high quality with an N50 of 14.3 megabases and a BUSCO score of 97.4%. We are waiting for HiC and RNA data for this species before we curate the genome and upload the assembly to NCBI for annotation. We've also sequenced the Lignaria propinqua species and several other Osmia species that are either agriculturally or ecologically important. For the last vignette, I highlight the bumblebees, for which we aim to sequence all of the U.S. species. Bumblebees are both agriculturally important and increasingly of conservation concern. The bumblebee projects are being organized by John Koch, Jeff Lozier, and others in the Benome um, Consortium. John Koch recently submitted a genome publication for the rusty patch bumblebee Bombus affinis, which is listed under the Endangered Species Act. Benome has also recently sequenced the western bumblebee Bob Bombus occidentalis, a close relative of affinis. It is being considered for listing under the Endangered Species Act due to observed and predicted population declines in the U.S. We have now generated HiFi and HiC data for this species. Shown here is the HiFi assembly only, generated from a male specimen. We recovered an N50 of 16.3 megabases and a BUSCO score of 97.5%. We estimate the genome to be about 380 megabases, which is consistent with other sequenced bumblebee species. We have many more bumblebee species in the sequencing queue, and we intend to collect more species this summer. Collaborators in the Benome Project have ongoing programs to examine the population genomics of bumblebees, we hoped, and we hope that these new reference genomes will aid these efforts. So what's next for Benome 100? Over the last two years, the Benome Project has developed a solid process of selecting and collecting bee species for genome sequencing and for sequencing and analyzing the data. The collecting of bees for phase one, which was to get a 100 target species, has mostly been completed. However, we have funds to continue to grow the project. 
Several priorities for adding taxa include collecting, collecting missing USB genera, collecting missing US bumblebee species, collecting, collecting host parasite pairs, um, and collecting host, host plant specialist generalist close relatives. We are also open to, to suggestions if you have any. A major push over the next six months will be to complete sequencing of the first 100 species and to get these genomes onto NCBI and annotated. Some of these finalized genomes will be written up as straightforward genome publications, but the larger Genome Consortium is also working on developing larger comparative studies that will provide more insight into the genome biology of bees. On behalf of the Genome team, Catherine Paris and I would like to thank Gene Robinson, Kevin Hackett, and Jay Evans for creating, organizing, and supporting the Genome 100 project. We also give thanks to the project leads and to the many collaborators and participants who come to our monthly meetings and who contribute ideas and material for sequencing. We look forward to sharing more results with you in the future. In fact, at the Entomology Annual Meeting this year, we have organized a symposium focused on genome and bee genomics generally. Please, please feel free to reach out to me, Catherine Paris, or Jay Evans if you have any questions or would like to participate in this effort. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much, Michael. Very good, both of you, uh, Catherine and Michael, for setting the spirit and the, the cool updates on this project. Um, why don't uh, the two of you, at least, if you could turn on your cameras and um, there is a question in the Q&A, maybe for Michael specifically. Okay. This is a um, plant sample, uh, maybe perhaps analogous to some of the challenges with getting DNA from bees. Uh, Brian had a comment about um, plant metabolites. Q&A. Um, Okay, well, yeah, let's there you're getting a few questions coming in for Michael and 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 or Hatton. so let's 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 answer those first and um they look quite important, and then we'll go on to a more general discussion perhaps after that. Yeah, I guess I'm not quite sure if Brian's is a question or just a statement, um, but the second one about the extraction method, so I'm pretty sure that Scott's lab is using you know what what I think has become sort of the standard you know, high molecular weight extraction approach, which is the Kyogen Magatract um, high molecular weight kit. Um, I know that's what Shenna has used um, in previous talks, but um, Scott would know best if they've changed those methods over time. And this, Damon has a question about manual curation of the genomes. Um, so yeah, so we are definitely, so when we have high phi and high C data, you know, we do the scaffolding with high C, and then we open the, the high C um, scaffolded genome and the assembly in juice box, um, and we're, we're doing manual annotations there. I should say that it's a skill Scott has mastered and, and John Koch and some others, but we're still, our team, um, Raina and Lee here are kind of mastering it. And so it's something we're gonna really push on soon because we need to do that before things get onto NCBI. But that high C uh, manual curation really helps us fix potential misjoins be between chromosomes and also just figure out what is a chromosome versus what is contamination or, or just small fragments um, or repetitive DNA. Just, just a quick and a corollary to that, if you mean for manual um, annotation of gene sets, uh, we are not there yet. We, as Michael, I think, highlighted this first tranche of genomes um, we hope to have processed more or less the same way by the NCBI gene prediction software and using BUSCO metrics and things like that. So there hasn't been much discussion of refining those gene sites and uh, gene sets and doing a, a third party annotation, for example, but um, it's a big tent. If you want to volunteer to help with that, I'm sure you would be most, most welcome uh, for genes of particular interest. You should be able to now see the uh, questions in the Q and A, and uh, if not, maybe the presenters could read the question. Brenda, I marked them red, so they should be over on the answered side. Looks like they might have been answered. Uh, for uh, Brian's highlighting the, the the secondary compound question. Um, oh, here's a new one. Go go for it, you two. 
Yes, the question is, does the genome size of bees vary similarly with the body size? Do you also find any evidence of for recent expansion of repetitive sequences in larger bee genomes? And the answer to that is, I don't, we don't know yet. Um, I mean, I think we have, you know, probably could look at some of the data that we have and make a guess, but I, I haven't sort of assessed that. Um, I think this is, those are some of the bigger questions that we want to sort of answer in one of the larger comparative papers. And one of the, you know, topics we've discussed is sort of a, you know, looking across all bees at sort of genome size and structure. Um, but we haven't, you know, we're still kind of just focused on getting the sequence data in and getting these assemblies done. But we did, one of the targets that we'd like to collect this summer is Perdita minima, which is one of the smallest bees um, in the world. And, and that is kind of a, you know, a potential sort of angle, which is, you know, does the smallest bee have the smallest genome? Um, similarly, there's a, a project on parasitic bees and, and there's at least some evidence that parasitic bees, like other parasites, maybe have reduced genomes. And so we have a bunch of parasitic bees sequenced now. And I think one of the angles of that project is to see, you know, relative to, um, to non-parasitic bees, and especially at the closest non-parasitic relative, you know, do you see, um, you know, declines in genome size? Um, and so that's one of the projects that, that we'd like to, you know, kind of develop in the next year or so. Michael and Catherine, I had a question, but I can't type it in. So if you don't mind me jumping in a little bit, um, do you see, I guess I should probably, last time somebody mentioned about my camera not being on, so hi. <laughs> so, um, so do you then find maybe possible interesting uh, patterns essentially? So for example, uh, like I said, it's been kind of documented before with regards to uh, euglosines uh, with genome duplication and things like that. Um, do you see some of that potentially detectable amongst the species in terms of like any signs of duplications that might be like tax size specific and things like that? Or is it too early to tell yet? No, go off, so I'm not distracting. Yeah, I would say it's still too early to tell. Um, and we definitely have a couple in the queue where, you know, you know we've noticed they seem to have really large genomes. What's hard is that we're still waiting for that high C data to come in to really confirm you know, what are the, the chromosomes? And I think we have a good sense from blob tools, like what's, you know, B versus contaminant, but it's really hard to sort of look at those genome size estimates, I think, until we've curated the genome, you know, and then gotten that sort of modified, you know, genome size number. And then certainly with the genome duplication, I think we need the annotation results. So again, like this is, this is kind of where we're at right now, I think, in Benome, which is really pushing forward on, on that side of things more, especially now that we have this 100 in. But it just, you know, I think we started with HiFi and it's this kind of getting that additional high C and RNA is just taking, um, you know, taking longer than maybe we initially thought. I think also we just, you know, as more funding has come in, we've realized we can expand to do all these kinds of sequencing on, on more of the taxa. Um, but thankfully, Scott just, you know, and I think maybe Brian too just got a PacBio Revio um, as well as a, a element of ED sequencer that I think once those are really up and running, we'll start churning out the data more quickly. And we'll be able to answer that question. But I do think there's a few bees we've seen that appear to have really large genomes. Um, you know, I think, you know, that, you know, I mean, in general, we still see this kind of average genome size of somewhere around 300 to 500 megabases. But occasionally there are these ones that kind of pop out, um, like the, the euglossines that appear to have more like one gigabase genomes. Um, but I think that'll be a really interesting question to see how common that is and how it varies across, you know, the bee tree of life, you know, whether there's, you know, any. And we can explain, you know, those patterns. Um, Stephania had a question about: are, are you currently exploring any projects related to, to temporal changes in bee genomes, considering that some species have been sequenced in the past, um, such as bumblebees? And I don't know if that's sort of you're trying. You think about like sort of a time series of like has the genome changed just within the last, you know, fifty years or thirty years? And and that that's not a question that we've we've thought about. Um, I, I think, you know, at the more basic level, you know, we are doing some resequencing um, of things that are already done. And those tend to be things like the Megachile rotundata and Osmia lignaria and some bumblebees where we know the original genomes were done with inferior technology. And so the, the, the quality of the assemblies are not as good. So we're trying to improve those assemblies. My sense would be that it would be really hard to make those comparisons between the old and the new because the technology has has changed so much. Um, and I hear a lot of people like Karen Kapheim, Karen Kapheim and others say that it really can affect, you know, you know, what you say about kind of gene structure and annotation. 
you know, just the quality of those assemblies. And so a major goal of ours is just with these new ones is to try to be really consistent about, you know, the, quali the quality of the genomes and the analysis approach. And I think where necessary, you know, we're doing some, some resequencing. Um, but, but certainly this idea of, of change over time is, is interesting. And there are some population genetics projects, you know, I think within bumblebees. And also we have one on kind of a museomics project with Bombus Franklin and I looking at population genetic changes over time. But I don't, I don't know anything about um, you know, actual genome structure changes over time. Um, I mean, I think the only kind of look at sort of changes in, or differences in genome structure within a species is Aryan's work, you know, doing the pan genome of the honeybee. Just to add a little bit to that, actually, there was some discussion of like once these are in, potentially taking a look at broader level concordance. So like, you know, if there could be ever a point where we can start looking at something like, you know, synthetic spans that I shared across variable groups. But I think, again, like you've mentioned many times now, the, the problem is just getting the genomes to be able to do that um, and getting the high enough resolution and coverage on that to be able to do that. So, um, so maybe stay tuned is the answer. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the good questions from the audience. I think um, we will progress if people uh, can stick around. We're going to have a. Say we've got another question that just popped in Oops, from Michael. Okay, well. let's do it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The questions. Yeah, about carrier typing prior prior to assemblies, and 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 the answer is no. We're not doing anything. So, and I haven't really done an exhaustive search of what's already been done. Um, so I mean, I, yeah, that would be kind of a, a nice thing to add to this. I guess, I guess our our approach is just to get these curated genomes and, and use that as kind of the for the chromosome counts. But yeah, I guess that'd be a nice question maybe for others here is is whether you know that I mean I, I don't see that being done in other kind of projects like this of doing that as part of the process. But I'm curious if if some folks do do that or it's something we should consider doing. It's a really good question. I think within the bumblebees, maybe, or sort of a group with a community of researchers and lots of neat evolution, it might be fun to see how different chromosome segments attach and move around. But um, but you, as as Michael said, we don't have the funding to do even uh, even genome size estimates. Uh, we're going in blind on some of these, right? And just um, trusting that the you know Brian, Shenna, and Scott can power through whatever we throw at them. So. You know, but but I think you know, guys. It it may not. I understand the the desire, but well, how about this? Right now, the the quality of everything what's coming out, and if you're doing the high C, you're probably identifying that, in the sense that you know it, it would the B chromosome would be there in your data. You just may not know that it's a B chromosome. Um. But when you look at what, what you're going to see, people, if you haven't seen some of the genomes, is a lot of these are almost telomere to telomere anyways. And so there's not a lot left over or gaps or anything. Yeah. Well, let's see. Maybe before, if people are uh, trending away, I, I can put up, uh, for those of you who are maybe new to this project and... Um, Again, we're we're interested in energy, you know, people coming in and helping, and it's been an egalitarian process, I think, kind of as people sort out what they want to do. But I can put up one in progress um, Google Doc that gives you a feel for, for kind of the questions that people are are at least discussing right now. Um, sorry, just a sec. Let me get back to my share screen. And that uh, that that uh, this is. This is, you know, sort of self-organizing colony of bees in action. But but these are the sort of some of the topics that have come up. And I think some of them that, that maybe have come up in the questions, and if you all have a passion for them, um, these uh, listed actors are flexible, in many cases, probably overextended. So if you want to take off on a topic and you're new to this uh, project, um, Maybe email that benome100 at usda.gov email address, and that will get to a few of us, I think. And um, we, uh, yeah, all of those great evolutionary questions, some of the conservation questions. Um, you know, there's there's expertise so far uh, in the group, but there's also, um, I think, room for for volunteers. I think 
At the moment, we can't pay salaries, but we can um, freely share data and and hopefully do some some enabling to make it easier for you if you want to join in on these all of these efforts. Just uh, yeah, so I'll stop sharing. But if you certainly, if you have open questions on that project, uh, get in touch. We're, it's exciting times, uh, and, and every month, uh, everyone, Catherine, Michael, Alicia, uh, and the sequencing centers show us new and exciting updates and it's it's chugging along it's not easy work especially at the front end um, well both ends but uh we do have monthly calls actually on thursdays second thursdays um as well but... we might have a t-shirt in the future uh based on margarita's cool image of a bee gnome so any graphic designers want to turn that into a hat or a t-shirt that that seems urgent any other thoughts uh, uh two of our sequencing folks and and anna i think you're still on the line if you want to um load up to the panel we'll, we'll happily get you about the um uh, scott and shen are in a training meeting this week so they couldn't join us why well, um uh, if you like Jay, I can tell you the group a little about the the Revio. So the what what's going to change here is the amount of output we can do uh, per cell. So the the cost of sequencing is going to go down dramatically. And so I, I can't even tell you how much a B genome is going to be, but I'm going to guess probably less than five hundred dollars is, uh, and it could be less than that. And um, in theory, you're producing 90 billion base pairs of high quality, up to 90 billion base pairs of high quality sequence um, per cell, which in the case of bees, that, that will be multiple bees we can do in one cell in one 24 hour period. So actually the way we have been functioning up to now, we're gonna to have to change our procedures and we're gonna to have to adapt something else because we're not going to be able to meet the throughput of the machine in our present techniques. We're gonna to have to increase DNA extractions and everything. So the the other problem is going to be then how to handle all of that data. It's gonna be massive. It's gonna be exciting people. Seems like a major bottleneck right now is not the high phi data, but getting the high C data and the RNA seq. And I and I I, I feel like our goal should be to get all of those things. Um, and I you know I think you know Scott's revving that up, but but that's the part that I think sometimes slows down finishing projects is having all three types. Yeah, the the high C. I mean, it's it's the same thing. It, we're going to have to scale up. I I have not tried to get. I see working on our robotics. So it's it's gonna just gonna take more robotics and stuff. And and it could be that if we change some of the techniques, we don't have to use as much DNA also or much as much tissue. Now it's gonna help us quite a bit. So we'll we'll see. The protocols that PacBio is developing with Corteva um, have not been for insects yet, but that's what we're talking with them about right now. Brenda, oh. I think Brenda Oppert has uh, just posted a question. I think she's referring to ISOSeq, maybe the long, long distance uh, RNA transcriptome se transcript sequences. Oh, long reads for annotating. No. Oh, okay. So what's going to change here? Um, so yes. Okay. So. NCBI, so she's asking about annotation. So, um, and most of the annotation, what NCBI has been supporting or asking for is actually our normal Illumina RNA seq data. Um, but PacBio is also working with them uh, to get that changed. Um, so, what's going to come up because of the Revio is we're going to be making what's called concatomers. So, you'll be doing ISOSeq. 
So long transcripts, linking those together and then sequencing maybe five or seven of those at one time. So I think what we're going to see over time for annotation, yes, we will do uh, a couple of cells for long, uh, long sequence that way. Um, and, and, and forget about the alumina sequencing, possibly. But that, that is going to become a cost-effective approach. It may be still probably more expensive than alumina, but it will be possible to do isoseq that way. Any other questions from the, maybe from the non-B folks who have hung in here for the, for these talks or, or suggestions? Oh, I'll, I mentioned one thing for the group, just so people don't, you, people were asking about the genome size and the, and the uh, size of the bees. Bees, I don't know. If we talk about insects in general, the, there may be some correlation there, but then there's the exceptions. So as an example, um, murder hornet, um, Asian giant hornet is a very large insect. The genome is very small, um, maybe 400 million base pairs. Ticks, the tick genomes run like 1.5 billion base pairs to 3 billion base pairs. Um, so when you look across species, that doesn't hold up necessarily, um, but we do find obviously uh, expansion areas and stuff. So we're, we'll have to get more samples and more sequence data to see if there's really a, a tighter correlation. And it's probably going to, if it does exist, it's probably going to exist within a particular line or something like that. Oh, thanks for that. I did not see that from the uh, someone who's in the comments about the estimating genome size. I'll take a look at that. Um, I can tell you genome scope has not worked very well for estimating gene, si gene size sometimes with um, hack bio data. It looks, looks like this is an inferential one with genomes on a tree, which is not a great resource for coordinating and advertising genome projects, but that, that is well worth checking out for our, our group. Thanks. Damon. Uh, anything else from the speakers? Last words of inspiration for all of us. I have a question for Arian. I was just curious with these pan genome projects. I mean, what's a good number of genomes to try and sequence, you know, to understand within species genomic variation? So that's that's kind group. of a question right now. So, and that's kind of what we're trying to even get a range for. Um, so like, you know, we're starting at both ends of that scale uh, to some degree with these two independent projects. Like the US based one is looking at these research lines that are all derived from the US population, which itself has gone through some bottlenecks and some specific admixture unique to it. And then specifically within that, we have um, uh, research lines that have been like artificially selected and gone through really tight bottlenecks uh, because they've been very heavily selected for specific traits and such. Um, and so we're going to be able to kind of say like, oh, okay, how useful is it to have these in terms of like, you know, or maybe we need to scale it back. Um, so one of the things that we've been doing recently, for example, is like clustering by genetic variation and then juxtaposing uh, within that sample set to see, and it, it turns out that there's actually, potentially we don't have to go down to the population level that like, you know, maybe a couple of representatives from uh, the genetic, with the genetic subgroup, let's say, uh, of these populations of which there are like roughly three uh, for the US ones, at least, at least for the, the sample set that I have, uh, might be enough, right? Uh, but then we're also tackling it from the other end of the scale with the worldwide kind genome where we're starting at the subspecies level because that's the taxonomic level that we're comfortable kind of starting from. Uh, but even there, that might be, that might go, that might contract instead of expand because uh, from past work, we know that like, you know, those 30 subspecies are really uh, representative of like these, I, I think it's eight now, uh, genomic subgroups. And so like, so yeah, so getting a sense of that scale is, is part of doing this work. But I, I get even that we don't know too much about. Um, and that's largely because there's so many critically undersampled populations that it's hard to be able to say. So it's like, until I get that answer on the broad scale, like I won't be able to say, 
And then on the shorter scale, I might be able to tell you, at least within the US, like feasibly what could be after this, after this assessment. So. So I, I I may have something to contribute here. So I I, I think that um, from my experience working on um, population genetics of widespread bees, um, it I think it will become the more and more we study these, you know, like unstudied bees, we will find a lot of um, cryptic species. Like for example, what happened with Prinosa, right? We started studying these species, and it's likely like five different uh, lineages. And um, for example, we, we sequenced uh, just for the Eastern lineage about 20 individuals, but because of the bottleneck uh, associated with expansion, right? Like the density of the markers was not really um, high enough, for example, to really break down those selective sweeps, right? So I think it may be, it may end up being very species specific depending on the, um, yeah, structure and kind of demographic history. Um, that yeah, and my <laughs> prediction. Yeah, and not too not too over, but like the you know, so there's things that are like specific to honeybees, right? So there's things that still need to be answered, right? So we don't really have, for example, a uh, uh, African subgroup uh, genome, right? And so that that might be its own beast, essentially. Not no no pun intended on that. Like just because like we really don't know. And that has the highest amount of species density and highest and the and most recent radiation from the latest uh, reports. So, so it's one of those where like, you know, because we don't know to what degree that variation might be present, like we don't, you know, we wouldn't know until we start kind of tackling them. Like, you know, whether, you know, one time genome from, you know, all those, what is it, 15 or so subspecies in Africa or something like that would be enough or if like, no, we have to go down to each one of the 15 and actually have representatives from each one of them. So, yeah. Um, I was really excited about your talk though, Margarita, and I don't want to derail the question too much, but like the, um, I'm kind of interested in that sort of that coalescent approach and seeing if, if you know, for at least for subpopulations or, or even like selected populations that could be you know, that could be something that could be informative in terms of uh, outlining some of these uh, subgroups for sure. Um, granted, we have, you know, we are more, which I guess in the wild, it would be comparable because I was, I was saying, I was going to say we have more intended loops in the trees <laughs> because of crosses. So uh, that might be a little bit harder on our end. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, with wild populations, that could be happening too. So it could, anyways, I'm kind of interested to see what that comes out. Yeah, not to keep it at honeybees, although it's in my DNA, but we have some experts, Elise Pinto and um, Matthew Webster are actually on. So there is a worldwide community looking at honeybee um, subspecies and, and race differentiation. So so this will be neat to see how how um, that can interact with those efforts, I guess, and combine. Um, anybody else? More minutes. Um, then I I just wanted to put this is my my advert of the week, and if it's not inherently apparent, I'm more of a cheerleader for this project than a uh, than actually a a bug net on the air participant. Um, but I love it, and I hope to get involved with some of the analyses. But part of our cheerleading just this week, uh, a lot of us have been pouring over the results from the zoonomia project. And this is again, like, like any genome initiative or any population genome initiative, it's, it's had lots of iterations. But if you, if you wanna read kind of a vision for how a community science or group science big effort can come together and make some cool stories, uh, this is one of them. And, and they just, uh, you know, they came out with some splashy, uh, a, a synthesis paper that again would be kind of everyone involved in these sorts of projects and then and then some companion papers 10 or so in science uh, a couple weeks ago and it, it's just really cool and it also to me it shows uh, what we're aiming for which is something that that uh, none of us could do alone um so check it out if you want and then um and get in touch if anyone who isn't uh tied to this project and has a skill set and, and an interest um We'll figure out how to uh, how to bring you in. Uh, Lindsay at 
AGSX, do you have any closing words for people on how to find resources or will that go around to the email list? Um, so I have put some links in the chat early on, and uh, that includes a link where previous recordings of these sessions and this session will eventually land. So if anyone wanted to rewatch a talk or go back and watch a previous session they missed, all that information will be will be there at that website. Um, and let's see, I can actually probably share it one more time so everyone has access to it. Um, See, take me just a second. And that, but that is all otherwise. Um, and I also wanted to apologize for the internet glitches as speakers really stepped up and um, was able to share their own talks. That was not intentional. We had um, internet problems here at, in College Station. So uh, yeah, Murphy's Law, y'all, I don't know. <laughs> but anyway. Um, I have no further things, so thank you so much. Cool. All right. Well, thanks everyone for hanging in there and for the speakers, especially for sharing your great work and uh, the enthusiasm for all these projects. Um, well, uh, yeah, we'll sign off for the day. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>